Well, here is, let's see how this works. Here, here is my topic. Uh, and I will be reading this solo a lot. Uh, ideal money and asymptotically ideal money. Preliminary remarks. I've been writing and speaking about ideal money for a few years now, but it was not until 2008 that there came into existence a time of global economic panic and recession. To avoid confusion, we want to remark that the concept of a system of money regarding as, uh, regarded as having ideal characteristics is proposed as a thing of value in terms of long-term economic interactions and the evolving equilibration of the characteristics of national, local, or global economies. It is not suggested that a shift from a money system that we could criticize as non-ideal would be a convenient or practical device for a state or an alliance of states to deal with a pressing financial crisis. In a crisis of that sort, a part of the challenge to leaders is simply for them to appear as if they're doing the most possible to enhance the immediate economic welfare circumstances of the people affected by their leadership. And at such times, progressive changes might not be well understood. President F. D. Roosevelt memorably caught the psychological atmosphere of a time of financial and economic strains and upheavals when he said, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. Now, by the way, I'm speaking essentially the version of this talk that I gave in January in Wallander, Germany. That was a business school location. They had a, a big meeting there, uh, people coming in. And uh, I, there was a section, I, I talked about Greece, it's later on. And soon after that, the, the, the Greek crisis developed, the, the sort of threat of bankruptcy of Greece, and Greece is now getting loans from the European Union and from the International Monetary Fund, and they're supposed to be agreeing to try to operate more, more economically in the government, and, and then to be able to pay back these loans. This is, of course, the International Monetary Fund has been lending to sort of second, third world places a lot in, in its history. But it doesn't function quite as it did originally but, uh, in terms of the, the, the first world countries. They, they used to have a linkage that they have lost, but they all to, uh, tend to develop floating currency rates. Well, revolutionary or evolutionary changes or reforms of systems of money. Our topic is focused on an idea, specifically on idea money, and it's not hard to see that there are naturally different routes by which a system of money might become either improved or might become in some senses more degraded and less worthy of praise. Change can come at a stroke, like when Alexander cut the Gordian knot, or it can come in a gradual fashion through many smaller steps. And this letter can be classed as the pathway of evolutionary change. It is easy to illustrate cases of revolutionary reform or change in systems of money. A good example came in 1717 when Isaac Newton he had been a long career, he was late in his life. He, was, he had then become a, a master of the mint, which is a higher level from his original position of warden of the mint. Supported by George I, fixed the value of the local UK currency, which has been called pound sterling, to a precise amount of gold that defined the value of the currency, the pound. See, as the pound, it's a pound sterling, it's silver, not gold. 
but Newton linked it to gold in such a way that it was immediately recognizable throughout the continent of Europe as of a fixed value in relation to generally accepted standards of the time. And this was the origin of the gold standard. Another example of revolutionary change was when Argentina attempted to establish an internationally respectable system of money by means of a currency board. This attempt failed conspicuously, but the failure was rather similar to a bankruptcy event involving an ordinary commercial bank, which simply turned out to have insufficient capital. And when the use of paper and printing was developed in China, that made possible another revolutionary change, namely the introduction of paper money. Now, I go through some of the relevant figures. Jacques Rueff, F.A. von Hayek, and Robert Mundell are notable scholars and economists who have particularly contributed to the theories of how a system or systems of money might be improved in an effectively revolutionary fashion. For example, there's been a quite dramatic improvement in the internationally perceived apparent quality of the money used in the countries of Italy and Greece simply because they have moved through the revolutionary transition of renouncing the use of the lira or the drachma and have accepted the use of the newly established euro unit. Now, I wrote this originally in an earlier time than when I made the remarks, the other remarks about Greece, because Greece has accepted the euro, but they've had, you're having trouble with it and because of that, in, in a sense. Evolutionary changes and relevant teaching. On the other hand, from the case of revolutionary changes, there's often the possibility that a system of money may gradually improve in quality, either through somewhat accidental circumstances, like a very favorable trade balance, or through the learning of good teachings of African varieties. A series of American economists have been notable through their contributions, which have enhanced the understanding of how systems of money actually function, and particularly of how the dollar and its value have been interacting with the relevant factors of influence. There's always been some populist thinking in the USA, which can encourage ideas about money that are not well based in any scientific sense. And the teachings of some of the notable economists have sometimes given a more scientific perspective on the areas where the populist viewpoints have been influential. M. Friedman, or Milton Friedman, now deceased, acquired fame through teaching the linkage between the supply of money and, effectively, its value. In retrospect, it seems as if elementary, <coughs> But Friedman was as if a teacher who retaught to American economists the classical concept of the law of supply and demand, this in connection with money. We can also notice at this point that the understanding of the effects of the uncontrolled behavior of all the various users of a domestic money is the inclusive category of description into which the notable contributions of a series of American economists can be recognized. F. Kidland, R. Lucas, E. Phelps, and E. Prescott are notable American economists who have contributed to the better understanding of issues arising in the area of theories of macroeconomics. Without arguing, for a direct constitutional reform of the status quo of the dollar in the USA, they have contributed much enlightenment in relation to the interactions between intelligent categories of the users of currency, or in particular the dollar, and the central authorities of central bank, treasury, state institutions, executive and legislative government. The evolving recognition of the fact that the users 
of a currency become like players in a game and have optional strategies by means of which they will be, be able to seek to optimize according to their own particular economic interests leads to the recognition that the task of central planners and managers of a state are not as simple as if they had only to herd flocks, herd flocks of sheep. Thus the users, like the managers, can be viewed as players in interactive games. In particular, with this perspective, it is natural to think of the users as having expectations in relation to the future value of the domestic currency, compared either with real assets, foreign currencies, or indices of cost. These expectations may or not be well-founded or rational, but they will inevitably guide or influence the choices made by the users. Thus, you have actually, if you have any money, you have the, the choice of putting it into gold nowadays. But formerly, that was prohibited in the United States from the 30s up through sometime, I don't know when, not so long ago. And there is a tremendous amount of gold hoarding in the world right now. General considerations in history. Now I go into some philosophy of government. The special commodity or medium that we call money has a long and interesting history. And since we are so dependent on our use of it, and so much controlled and motivated by the wish to have more of it and not to lose what we have, we may become irrational in thinking about it and fail to be able to reason about it as if about a technology, such as radio, to be used more or less efficiently. Use, oh, I've got so thought there, but there's, the word less is missing. Uh, we present the argument that various interests and groups, notably including Keynesian economists, have sold to the public a quasi-doctrine it's not quite formalized, which teaches, in effect, that less is more, or that, in other words, bad money is better than good money, or that inflation is better than the absence of inflation. Here we can remember the classic ancient economic saying called Gresham's Law, which was, the bad money drives out the good, the saying of Gresham's, that Gresham was back around the time of Queen Elizabeth. The saying of Gresham's is most of interest here because it illustrates the old or classical concept of bad money. And this can be contrasted with more recent attitudes, which have been very much influenced by the Keynesians and by the results of their influence on government policies since the 30s. The aggression on the philosophy of money. It seems to be relevant to the politics of state decisions that affect the character of currency systems promoted by states that there are typical popular attitudes in relation to money. Although money itself is merely an artifact of practical usefulness in human societies and our civilizations, there are some trans traditional or popular views associating money with sin or immorality or, or unethical or unjust behavior. And such views can have the effect that an ideal of good money does not seem such a good cause as an ideal of a good public water supply. There is also, for example, the Islamic concept, which has the effect of classing as usury any lending of money at interest. Here we can wonder about what sort of inflation rates might have been typical for any major varieties of money, such as Byzantine money, at the times actually contemporaneous with the Prophet Muhammad. If nowadays you could take out the best sort of a mortgage, 